Amen. And as you're having a seat, go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 4. We're going to be in John 4, continue our miracle series. Hey, listen, we sing this song, God, do what you want to. I hope it's your prayer today. What if God wants to do something in you today? What if he does? I hope you're ready because I think God is a God who moves in a miraculous way. You guys are kind of in shock and awe because it's early in the service and we're having the sermon now. So just readjust, grab your Bibles. It's okay. John chapter 4, we, we've been talking, um, actually began talking last week about creating margin for God to do miracles. We believe God's a miracle God, but we believe that we're also often too busy to notice what he's doing. And so here's what we're going to try to do for this next month. I hope you've been praying about it. I hope you've been thinking about it. How can I use my schedule in a different way and create margin so that God can do miraculous stuff in my life? And uh, I, just, I just believe that we, we need to leave room for God to do miracles in our lives and miracles in the lives of people around us, through us. God wants to use us. He wants to do something miraculous in us. And so we're hoping that the fearless followers of Eastview, three or 4,000 of us, will commit to creating margin. And that in the month of November, we'll see some great miracle work of God uh, in our midst. I just want to let you know that I'm being a part of this. I'm creating space for God to do miracles in my life personally. Beginning tomorrow morning, I'm fasting from all email, Twitter, and texting for the first three days of this week just to cleanse my soul so I can just pay attention to everything else that God's doing in my life. And then every, I I shared this last week, uh, every first hour of every day for the month of November, I'm not touching my smartphone. It's going to be hard. Okay, but I'm going to try to do it, all right? Uh, Some other staff members, we have a staff member who's going to carry around the $20 bill just asking God every day. I've got a $20 bill. If you want me to give it to somebody or use it to help somebody, I've got a $20 bill uh, um, creating margin for that. Another guy's taking no outside speaking engagements for this month. Somebody else is watching no TV for the entire month of November. Would you join us? And would you share with us what you're doing on, um, yeah, that was smooth. On ECC Miracles, hashtag ECC Miracles. If you're not young and hip, that's something you do on social media. You let people know, and we all do this together. We share and we push each other to keep doing this thing. I believe that God's going to do something miraculous in us in the month of November. Not because that's rare for him, because it's rare for us to pay attention And so let's pay attention to what he's doing, church, and let's see, let's pray, let's create margin, let's bring your friends, let's watch what God does, and then we'll give him all the praise. Well, the stories of Jesus, as we said last week, happen mostly in the margins of life. They happen on the way. They happen at the weddings. They happen at the funerals. They happen in the most inopportune and unsuspecting times. God does miraculous stuff in the margins Sometimes we create margin like we're praying about this month, and sometimes life creates margin. All of us have experienced it, and usually this is the time where we really ask God to do miraculous things. Those times in life when something happens in our schedules and our priorities and our business continually, it just gets thrown out the window immediately. Let me give you an example. You go to the doctor with a nagging pain, or you go just for a checkup, and, and he comes in and he says, you know what? We think you've got cancer. We think you've got a heart condition. You need bypass surgery. You don't say to the doctor, you know what, it's kind of busy right now. Christmas is coming. Let's just wait and we'll start the process. No, everything in your schedule stops immediately because an emergency has come in. Some of us in here have experienced the late night call, 2 o'clock in the morning. You get that call. There's an emergency. Somebody's in the hospital. Somebody's sick. Somebody's had an accident. Guess what? Your 6 o'clock morning meeting just got canceled because you're going to go to the hospital. You're going you're gonna to leave the stuff that you've got. Some of you have, have spent that night with the child up all night crying and struggling with some kind of illness, burning with a fever, and you go, okay, I'm not going to work tomorrow. Your schedule changes because sometimes life forces margin where God can work the most. And today we're going to look at that because in John chapter 4, verse 46 through 44, we see the story of a man who, who a margin comes into his life through the illness of his son. He has a little boy who's sick, and Jesus does something miraculous. Let's look at John 4 today, starting with verse 46. John 4, 46, let's let the word of the Lord speak to us today. So he came to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. The he is Jesus here. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man had heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and he asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, 
Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. And so he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea. To Galilee. Let's ask the Lord today to do what you want, Lord, with this passage in our hearts. God, I pray that you would do what only you can do. Would you work miraculously in us today by your holy word as I preach? Give me your spirit's movement. Move in our hearts, God. We believe that you're a supernatural God. You're not bound by time or space or even our inconsistencies or our lack of attention. You, you can speak. And so we ask, come here now. Do something powerful in us in this place. By your word, by the power of your son, Jesus, the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you can tell the miracle need intensifies this week. Last week, we talked about the water to wine. That's emergency because you ran out of refreshments. This week, it gets a little bit more serious. There's a sick young man, a little boy who's sick, and he's at the point of death. And so we come to this official miracle prayer. There's a double entendre there. There's an official here. There's somebody, he's super important. See there in verse 46, he's an official. The word has in the Greek language, it has the word king in it. So in other words, he's associated with some king. Some people guess that he's working in the palace for King Herod, but he's at least got enough pull and enough, you know, enough power that he can go and take care of the sickness of his child. He can get some time off. Many of your Bible versions say it's a royal official. But I just want to point out something here. He's busy. He's doing king work. He's got appointments in the palace. He's arranging things for the king. We don't know what his job was or what he was supposed to do, but he's an important official. He has a title, and he's busy if he's like us at all. He's likely got some important work to do, but sometimes something happens in the middle of life that says it doesn't matter how busy I am, this is the most important thing. For him, he had a sick little boy. His son was sick, and uh, his, his son was, was really sick. If you just look at some of the, the clues we get here in this passage, in verse 46, it says he was ill. In verse 52, it says that he had a fever because it says the fever left him. That word fever literally is the word in Greek that means hot. So if you've ever held a little baby that has a fever, you know how hot that is. It's just an intense heat. His son has a fever. His son is ill. His son, verse 47 says, was at the point of death. Now, in our 21st century mindset, we might go, oh, well, he's got a, it's a kid with a fever, you know, give him some drugs and he'll be better, right? Just give him some, some, you know, make sure he has plenty of fluids and let him rest and he'll be fine because that's the way we think in our culture. But in the first century Roman world, child mortality rates uh, were half of the, all children born died before age 10. So we're, we imagine this kid because he's called a paideon, which is the word for child or little child in the Greek language. He's a young boy. He's maybe six or seven years old. It's a six or seven year old boy. He's the son of the official and he's dying. He has fever. It would not be weird for him to die in the first century. And so this is important. It's desperation time. And apparently whatever they're doing in the first century doctor world to make him better is not working. He's desperate. He needs a miracle. But there's another option besides all the doctors. And I want to go to the map just a moment because I think this is, will help us understand so clearly some of the stuff that's going on. Uh, you can see the, that uh, uh, this, this uh, man is from Capernaum. Capernaum is the place where Jesus ends up doing his, his ministry. And Jesus has come back now to, to this place called uh, Cana, all right? And I'm not going to write in all the words because this is going to look like a scribbled mess in just a moment, right? As always, I'm going to let you know Indiana's that way, okay? Uh, just make sure you guys are with me. All right. Uh, I, I want to tell you what's happened with Jesus since last week's miracle. 
Since last week's miracle, uh, ch- changing the water to wine, Jesus makes him, his way down to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. It's the greatest feast of all the people of Israel. Everybody who's a good Israelite, good Jewish person, has made their way down to Jerusalem. Now, you remember this place called Samaria in the middle of the country was kind of no man's land for Jewish people. So people from Galilee made their way down along this way and came into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. Jesus did the same thing. But what you may not know, unless you read these verses I encourage you to later is that Jesus, while he's at the feast, he's performing signs. He's doing some, some miracle work there. In chapter, chapter 2, 23 of John, it says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. And one Jewish leader named Nicodemus, remember him, he comes to him at, in chapter 3 at nighttime. In chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Nicodemus says, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So then Jesus, uh, after the Passover, he makes his way back to hang out with his cousin's baptism ministry, and he's actually baptizing people near the Jordan River. And then he does something super strange. In chapter 4 of John, he makes his way over here to hang out with the woman at the well, totally non-Jewish, totally uncool in their culture. But at some point, he comes back into Galilee, and he finds himself at Cana, all right? Now, all this ties together because now there's this official in Capernaum over on the sea, and Jesus is in Cana, and this official says, okay, here's the thing. I am going to go and ask Jesus to do a miracle. How did the official hear? How did the official know that Jesus was back? How How did the official know that Jesus could do miracles? Well, because people were pouring out of here back to their homes all around the Sea of Galilee. Isn't that beautiful? Da, 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 da. People were, thousands of pilgrims after Passover came back to their homes and the buzz, they didn't have cable back then, the buzz was Jesus is doing miracles. His name is becoming this famous miracle worker. And so here's the official miracle prayer request. Jesus, come down and heal my son. Now you might be looking at this and go, how is this down? Because this looks like north to me. But if you go from Cana, it's in the mountains, and I've totally scribbled this whole thing up. That's beautiful. Come on, son, get your act together. I don't know what just happened. Oh, no. The Lord said, stop that part of the sermon. Okay. (laughs) Cana is in the mountains, okay? Whenever in the Bible when you read go up or go down, they're talking about about altitude, okay? They're not talking about north and south. And so to go down from Cana to Capernaum means you go down to by the sea, which the Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. So this official comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, my son's sick. Would you come down to the sea? Would you come to Capernaum? Would you heal my son? And Jesus uses this as a teaching moment. Now remember, people are pretty excited. He's got a buzz going. He's kind of a celebrity guy. They're asking for autographs. He's kissing babies, right? They're excited because he's doing miracles. And Jesus uses this chance to give a little lesson. Verse 48, look at this. It's important for us today. Unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. In other other words, Jesus, and he says this all through the teaching of John. Next week we'll talk about the feeding of the 5,000. He's going to say the same thing. You guys are only back here because you like bread free. And I gave it to you last time. And now you're back for more. He goes... Here's the thing about me and my ministry. I'm not just some circus sideshow. I'm not here to do tricks so you guys will be amazed and ooh and ah every time I do something awesome. I'm here for faith. I want you to trust me. I want you to believe in me. Look what he says in verse 48. Can you imagine the throngs of people around him? This is important. Unless you, that's a plural you. He's talking to tons of people. Can you imagine the pushing and shoving? I'm trying to get my sick grandma. I'm blind. I can't see, but I'm pushing through the crowds. There's people crying out, Jesus, heal me. And somehow this official gets in Jesus' face and says, come heal my son. And this is it's pandemonium. And Jesus stops and he says, listen, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe Jesus wants to remind all of them, and he wants to remind us today that miracles are never about miracles. I want you to hear that today. As we're praying for God to do miracles in this month of margin, miracles are not about miracles. If they were, Jesus would have just done billions of them because he has the power. 
Miracles are about something deeper. God's trying to do something. Look in verse 48. See these two words paired together. Signs we talked about last week. It's a pointing to something. It's a mark. It's signifying something. But it's paired together this week with the word teros, which is the word for miracle. The word, si- the word wonders, miracle, never comes without the word signs in the Bible. You know why? Because every miracle is pointing to something. It's pointing to God in the flesh through Jesus Christ. It's pointing to faith. Miracles are for signs pointing us to Jesus and therefore to God. God gives us miracles every once in a while to say, hey, keep believing. The question for us today is, do you believe no matter what? I mean, you have to answer that question. Do you believe no matter what? Because if Jesus were talking to this audience today, he would say, unless you see signs and wonders, what would be that blank for you? Unless you see what? You won't believe. Because some of us kind of back Jesus into a corner that way and say, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, then do this. Uh, people have even prayed. We see it in a movie. Something, God, if you're up there, do this and I'll believe. And many times, those of us who are visiting today, if you're not, not a believer and you're just visiting, we're glad you're here. But here's the question. What will Jesus have to do in your life today for you to believe? And then for the rest of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, what does Jesus have to do for us to believe more? Does he have to fix our family? Does he have to heal us uh, physically? Does he have to make our finances better? Does he have to heal our personal relationships? Does he have to give us a job or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a new car? What does he have to do to make us believe in him? Jesus would say, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. Well, I love this dude because this guy's persistent, if nothing else. Jesus is going into his Jesus teach mode, and he's going, whoa, 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 stop. Look at verse 49. He just cuts him off. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. I, I, I get your lesson, but I just need you to do something. I need you to work miraculously in my child's life. There's a couple observations here I have as we go into this month of miracles, and I want us to pay attention to this. The Bible supports two of these very, very well. First of all, Jesus wants us to trust him, period. He wants us to trust without the miracle. He wants us to understand that he is the Lord and the Savior, and he's God in the flesh, and that he doesn't need to do anything else for us. He's enough. And he wants us to believe that. Also, the Bible says it it seems that God never minds our persistence in asking for stuff. Like Like a parent at the checkout counter when the kid wants every candy that's available, and, and for my wife, when the husband wants every candy that's available, <laughs> can I get this, please? He never minds us as children asking him for stuff. Don't ever get the impression that Jesus and God are going, that's enough. Don't ask me for anything. They understand. God understands our heart. He understands our understanding. He understands our lack of knowledge. And so we ask God. We never stop asking. I love the fact that this guy hears two things. Hey, it's about faith. I know that, Lord, but would you heal my son? And those things go together. That's the official miracle miracle prayer that all of us in here have. Jesus, come and heal. What do you want Jesus to heal today? What is it that you are saying to Jesus, Jesus, would you come and heal this in me? Well, as usually it turns out, guess what? Jesus doesn't answer prayers the way we ask them. Jesus always answers prayers. He always answers requests, but he rarely, I might say in my own life and experience, he never does it the way that I would. Look what Jesus says. This man says, I want you to come down and heal. And Jesus says, nope, I'm not going to come down and heal. You go and believe. You go, your son will live. I want you to believe what I'm saying to you. You go. Often we get wrapped up in how we think God should answer our prayers, and we get mad at him because he didn't do what we ask in the way we ask. How many of you guys have ever just gotten frustrated with God because he didn't answer the prayer when or how you thought he should? Just raise your hand. Okay? The rest of you all need to come forward about lying later, all right? All right. We've all been frustrated with God before. It's because God answers our prayers in his great knowledge and his grace and his wisdom. He doesn't give us what we want because I've had prayer requests I've asked God for a million times and I didn't get them. And five years later, I'm going, whoo, glad God didn't answer that one. I would have been a mess. 
God works in mysterious ways. We say, come and heal, and he says, go and believe. We ask God, help me love others more. So he transfers us next to the most unlovable coworker in the building. We ask God, God, would you help me grow in my relationship with you? So he makes your girlfriend or boyfriend break up with you. So you have to focus on him. And we get mad at him. God, heal my grandma and take away her pain. So he takes her out of this world, literally no more pain. And we get mad because grandma died. Right, God, give me an open door for witness. And so he gives us some kind of disease or puts us in a hospital. We have open door to share with cancer doctors. We pray, God, grant me patience. So he makes us Cubs fans. And we, <laughs> sorry, couldn't, couldn't resist. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that God answers our prayers in different ways. We, we don't know how he's going to answer our prayers. All we can come to him and say like this official, come heal my son. Please help my, help my son. That's all I know, God. I don't understand that. I want you to see that belief kind of happens in stages here. In the story, it's miraculous. I've, I've got belief 1.0. It's belief on the way. Go, your son will live. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'm like, um, can I get a receipt? Can I get a confirmation number on this miracle? Would you send it to my email address? Because... I, I, you know, I didn't say this earlier, but it's 20 miles, guys. It's 20 miles from Cana to Capernaum. Uh, and now you're just, the, the, the guy who's healing everybody in Jerusalem just looks at me and says, hey, go home. Kid's good. I've got I've to make a choice at this point. This official had to make a choice. It's now 1 p.m. The seventh hour starts at 6 a.m. sunrise in the Jewish ca counting of time. So it's 1 p.m. in the afternoon. When I left home yesterday morning or maybe this morning early, my son was burning up with a fever. And now this miracle worker says, just go home. He's fine. I have a choice to make. I believe it or I don't believe it and I keep begging. For whatever reason, this guy, maybe his faith is greater than ours, the man believed, look in verse 20, 50, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. He's fine. It, you know, it, again, don't you need to touch him? Don't you need to pray over him, say something like be healed or something, oil or something? No, just go. He's fine. 20 miles away, Jesus can see a sick kid and he can heal him without even going there. And amazingly, the official believes the word of Jesus which, of course, is the whole point of miracles, the believing the word of Jesus, and he believes. Now, again, I just want you to kind of imagine this journey down the hills of Cana, down to the, the, to the flat land and the below sea level of Capernaum. It's 20 miles if Jesus spoke at 1 p.m., the guy probably journeyed maybe 10 or 12 miles until it got dark, Remember, he's walking over mountainous terrain. It's hard going, slow going. He probably stayed in some small town. He got up the next day to start heading towards Capernaum. And then finally, we don't know, a mile from home, two miles from home, he sees his servants running towards him. You know, this week, uh, as we were praying through this and talking about this, our young adult pastor, Charlie, he called this the miles between the miracles. That's life. Our faith are the miles between the miracles. We know Jesus can do miracles, and most of us in here would testify that he has. But we will also testify that many of us need another miracle. We need him to do something crazy awesome in our life. And we're walking that road going, I don't know. The, the Bible says this man believed, but don't you believe that there was just a little bit for him of the fear of the unknown? Doubting how it's going to turn out? anticipating what's going to come. Do you, can you imagine what first feeling he had when the servants were running to him? He saw them from a distance. Wow, how's this going to turn out? You see, what I believe is that a lot of times our faith is faith, but there's also this little room for doubt and this little room for, oh, I don't know how it's going to work out. Even when God works, we sometimes go, oh, is that how we're going to do it, God? And so he's walking home, these miles between the miracles kind of become a metaphor for me and you because even those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ have miracle needs in our lives and they don't seem to be answered all the time. Here's what you need to know if you're visiting today and maybe if you just come every once in a while, 
or if you're a member, you need to know that all around you today, the people you're worshiping with, um, there's a lot of miracle needs in here today. There's a lot of pain. Or I say it this way, you people are sick, right? We, we are. We, we've got stuff going on. Next week, we're going to offer a miracle Sunday. We're going to have elders come and, like James 5, anoint with oil and pray for people to be healed. And I can tell you that people have been miraculously healed right down here. I can also tell you that there are believers here who need a miracle for a serious illness, maybe for a sick child like our story today, maybe for them personally, maybe for a spouse. They need God to do a miracle, and they'll ask for it next week. There's some people here who need a miracle of freedom from depression and emotional pain that we all sometimes face. There's people that are going to ask for emotional healing from scars of the abuse of the past. Of the past. Still, others are going to ask for spiritual healing to overcome a sin or an addiction or an attitude. Other people in this room will pray for their relationships with their children or their spouses or their friends to be healed and restored. We have a lot of needs for miracles in this place right now. We, we want God to move in a miraculous way. We fearlessly follow Christ under these circumstances, believing we believe as we walk, but we still need miracles. And we know that God is a God of miracles. We also know that everything in our life is not miraculous. How's that work out? Remember the, the story in Acts chapter 4, verse 29 and following? The apostles had just spent the night in jail. They had been interrogated. They, later, they're going to get beaten and thrown in jail for a longer time, threatened with their lives. And they get out and they begin to pray, God, hear their threats, hear what's going on, hear what they're saying. And God, even as you stretch out signs and wonders in the church to bring people to faith, what was going on? They were living in the church where there were signs and wonders. God was doing miracles. At the same time, they spent the night in jail. Why are there some miracles that God does and others that he doesn't? Well, I think the Christian walk is a paradox of pain mixed with miraculous joy because here's what we believe and if you're a believer here today I want to remind you what we believe the Christian walk is about believing that Jesus is the ultimate healer first and foremost for our sins that Jesus has taken all my sin he's taken all of your sin and he miraculously has washed it away not the way I would do it by the way by dying on a cross He's miraculously taken away all my sin, and he has overcome death by promising eternal life to me, and he's making me a new creation. And because of that, I believe in hope. I believe in the miracle of Jesus changing me spiritually. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so if he can do that, I know he's a miracle God. So I can walk in the painful, fearful, challenging miles between the miracles because I know who Jesus is, and that's enough. Today, whatever miracle you've seen or you see or you don't see, Jesus says to us, go and believe. Just trust me. Just trust that I've got it. But I want you to notice here how this belief increases. I want you to notice how the official's faith grows as he gets down to the story in verses 52 and 53. He believed the word of Jesus. He begins this journey, this miles between the miracles, this a day and a half journey home, his servants meet him on the road. And, and they get excited. I can imagine the joy, the relief, the excitement. Yes, my son's better. Jesus is awesome. And then at some point, because he's human, he goes, hey, wait a minute. Just out of curiosity, what time yesterday? What time? Can you imagine the emotion when the servant said, I, you know, I think it was about 1 o'clock. I think it's about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Can you imagine what happened to this man's faith when he heard them say it was the seventh hour that the fever suddenly left him? That's exactly when Jesus said, your son will live. And now he knew that Jesus had healed his son. Now he knew that Jesus is a miracle worker. Now he knew that he could believe. it. He believed when he said, go home, your son's fine. Now he believes even more because it happened at exactly the right time. I, I wish that I could tell you all the stories that happen around here every Sunday. Somebody meets somebody in the hallway that they used to know from 20 years ago that's been praying for them for the last 15 years that 
what came with another friend that they all knew in high school. These coincidences that seem to happen all the time when Jesus is involved. What time did he start getting better? One o'clock. Exactly when Jesus said. Now listen, he knew that Jesus healed his son. That's the reality. But he also, he also knew that he wanted to share this reality. And that's where his faith gets even stronger. When you live a life where God does miracles through his son Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life, then you, you go to another level of faith. I want you to see what happens to this whole household here. The father knew, verse 53, that the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live, and he himself believed, and all his household. Again, we have to imagine who this official was. Maybe he had all kind, he has servants, at least enough servants that are disposable to go and tell him the good news that his son's better. He's probably got a large house. He may have 20 or 30 people that he calls his household, servants and family and relatives who live with him. I want you to see what Jesus does here. He doesn't even come to Capernaum. He's long distance, and he says, hey, you know what? Just go home. Your son is better. And in that one statement at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he changes the life of the father, the life of the son, and he changes the life of the household. Why? Because the, son, the father, I believe, we're imagining here, he becomes an official evangelist of Jesus Christ. Don't make evangelist into some big churchy word. It simply just means to tell the good news. Hey, it's good news. My son was dying, and now he's well. Maybe he's set on, he said, hey, get the whole family together. He sits his well son on his lap. He says, let me tell you about my journey. Let me tell you how it worked out. Let me tell you crowds. And I asked Jesus to heal my son. He said, go, your son's better. He tells the whole story. He becomes an evangelist because of what he believes. Ultimately, this month of margin is for us to see God work miracles in our lives and the lives of those around us so we can say, hey, that's Jesus. And we can point to him and we can point others to him. Wow, it must have been an incredible revival moment in that house. Now, here we come to an interesting question. Do you ever wonder how we got this story in the Bible? Let me think about it. John was over here in Cana. He's one of Jesus' apostles. The last thing he knows, he's kind of doing crowd control, pushing people away, and he hears Jesus look at, a, 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 you know, at a, an official and go, hey, go home, your son's fine. John heard that part. But only Jesus knew what happened on the other end. What I love is that that Jesus eventually makes Capernaum his home base. If you know his ministry, Capernaum is the place where Jesus and his apostles settle. He does all of his ministry for the next three years out of that place. Don't you think? Don't you think there's a moment where this guy comes up with his son holding his hand? Jesus! Jesus! This is, this is my son. He's the one you healed. I just want to let you know, thank you. I believe. Can you imagine John? John's sitting there going, oh, interesting. <laughs> He's writing John 4. <laughs> he remembers the story because the, the father probably came back and said, hey, this is the one. This is the one you healed just by your word. The apostle John must have noticed in the the apostle John and the other apostles must have been strengthened in their faith. Again, he can turn water to wine. He can heal from long distance. He's a miracle God. And he's done a miracle here in us. John would later remember this as the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea in Galilee. Into Galilee. You know, John says at the end of his book, I want to remind you, John 20, 30, there's a lot of other signs Jesus did. There's so many I can't even put them in this book. I didn't write them all down. But I've written these that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you might have life in his name. Guys, I, I pray that we are getting ready to experience an outpouring of God's miracles. But even if we don't see something miraculous, I believe because of who Jesus is. And I pray you do too.
Well, now we're going to worship this God and this king. So I'm going to invite you all to stand up and let's worship with Matt and the band.